They communicate through every avenue. I want to talk to the kids. Your parents screwed up. You can come hang out with me. They're coming after the kids and they even say it. It's really easy to trick a kid into things. It was sheer indoctrination. This is how I tuck my little privates away. Okay. Wear a binder without your parents knowing. Your parents don't love you. We don't know a person's gender by looking between their legs. She knew that something was happening to her. If you're questioning whether you're trans, that probably means you are trans. My daughter was really sweet. She was a super girly girl, uh, which was actually difficult for me because I'm a tomboy. I was a sports player. My daughter liked only pink. I had to paint her room pink. That was not something I was <laughs> really thrilled about, but she wore dresses. This was on her own accord. She wore dresses for years, and that's all she would wear. I'm Erin Friday. I'm a mom of a girl who used to think she was a boy. Well, it started with my child coming home from seventh grade, the sex ed uh, course that she took. So for my daughter's school, it was called Health Connect. And if you look them up on the internet, you can kind of see who the teachers are and it will be very obvious how extreme left they are. There's a lot of he, him, they, thems. And so they come into the classroom and they teach for five straight days and they teach an entire hour on gender ideology with cute little cartoons of a body and it says female body and then there's an arrow pointing to the head that says male brain. So that's not based on fact. There's no science that there are male brains, female brains in different sexed bodies. It's all made up, but that's what they're taught. And they're taught that for an entire hour. Better yet, they have a video of a young trans kid talking about being trans. Someone asked me why I used to be a boy and now I'm a girl. I would say that I have a girl brain and boy body. The school plays a, such a significant role in any kid's development because that's where they spend the predominant amount of their time, so more so than the parents. Is it okay to be different? Yes. You like it? I'm Dr. Nicholas Cardaris. I'm a psychologist, I'm a clinical social worker. So whatever the school ideology is, if you're going to a public school versus a Christian school or a Catholic school or a charter school, and, and you know, unfortunately you have tenured teachers. I mean, I worked in a school district, a public school district uh, on and off in my capacity for about 15 years. And you saw that there were some entrenched, unwell teachers who I wouldn't trust with my, you know, to water my plants because let's face it, they weren't just teaching content, they were teaching whatever their uh, ideology was, quite honestly. And we used to think that sometimes that wasn't a bad thing. We used to say that, you know, historically, you would want your teacher to be a mentor, not just a, a, a disseminator of content. You would want your math teacher to ask you how you're doing at home and to maybe be a support. But that kind of morphed into, now you're gonna follow lockstep. Teachers would proselytize. Thus, what should have developed into a sequence of pleasant and valuable learning experiences had deteriorated into a series of disagreeable and injurious personal tensions. Middle school was tough. She started to get bullied at school. There were almost weekly calls of, can you pick me up from school early? So something was happening at school. Hi, Rychik is the founder of Libs of TikTok and the woman you just saw in that video, she joins us now. Hi, thank you so much for coming on. A lot of what we're discussing with these activists and groomers um, and predators is a lot of times they're actually preying on children who might who might have some insecurities. And they're basically told, if you join this community, right, you're gonna feel so special and you're gonna feel so loved. It's just full of love and acceptance and inclusivity and praise. If you're an unpopular kid and all of a sudden you raise your hand now and you say, I'm non-binary, you have now moved into the popular circle. You're gonna get accolades and attention that you wouldn't have 
otherwise. And I think that's the messaging that's going out there to a lot of our kids. They're saying that it's an aspirational identity to own. It combines a lot of victimhood and coolness at the same time. And so I think it's unfortunate. I'm not a monster. I'm not somebody that, you know, um, is trying to, to do anything but be myself and be happy. Thank you. Love ya. Thank you everybody for that support. So I was a professor for 10 years and worked for high school kids for almost 20. You saw each cohort as they got older seemed more and more fragile, seemed more and more unwell. And, and again, because of the work that I do, it seemed like each cohort that was more and more digitally shaped and influenced was more and more not connected, but, but more and more psychiatrically, or, or at least seemingly psychiatrically unwell. I mean, they may not have had these genuine disorders, but they certainly weren't resilient. They were not anti-fragile. Just because you're autistic does not mean that your trans identity is invalid. I want to talk about DID, transness, and my specific experiences with how they interact. <laughs> I don't get accommodations for being neurodivergent. And a customer was misgendering me tonight, like really badly. I didn't have their order ready. Guys, I'm literally shaking for no fucking reason. I was just misgendered by this person I was helping at work on. I don't understand what is so hard about correcting other people when they misgender others. Like, it takes you like two seconds, but you know what it takes for me to have to constantly do that? A lot of fucking unnecessary emotional labor that I already have to take on on a daily basis just to fucking exist. We had given her a phone and I had blocked all social media but she's smarter than I am and she got around it. Somehow she got onto Tumblr and to Reddit and there were also older kids telling her how to do it. And when I say older, she's 12, 13 and they're 16, 17 and they're telling her how to get onto these platforms. So when I would check her phone, I would see the TikTok that I had set up for her. I would see her videos that were kind of G-rated because mom's checking on them. But there was another TikTok account that's hidden beneath that. She was talking to people in different states. They had actually been playing, and I'm gonna get the game wrong, but some like really cute kid game. It was similar to Club Penguin, or if it wasn't that one, but where you can actually reach other people. So this is how other people got into her sphere. Who knows if they were grown-ups pedophiles, what they were. Once they got a hold of her and her friend group, then they went on Google Docs and they would start conversing. So that's where we started down this kind of rabbit hole of social media influencing her. You know, it's a trajectory. It's step one, step two, step three, step four. The thing about the content on TikTok specifically though, is that they're so proud of it. The typical teacher video is a teacher showing off their classroom filled with LGBTQ+, whatever, propaganda, like all over. They have rainbows all over, they have progress pride flags hanging, usually comes with a BLM flag as well. It's Pride Month! I got these flags from Target in like the dollar bin, so that's amazing. My classroom is one of the gayest places probably on the planet. Miko is one of my students. What do you call me, Miko? Them. This has been my first year in preschool with a class of my own, teaching alongside another queer neurodivergent educator, and we have been rocking our two's class. We've been talking about gender. Do we, have to, do we say them or the, they? Uh, you would say they if you were saying if you were talking about me, and you're like they are really awesome. Few things in society provoke a, a more passionate uh, disagreement than. Uh, what we should do about our children. Erica Anderson, I'm a clinical psychologist for many years. So I had a chance over these years to sort of take note of some changing trends, uh, certainly to take note of the fact that we were getting many, many more referrals year over year than we had. And the changing composition of the group that was coming to the clinic, it became far more heterogeneous than it had been before. It became predominantly female. So these demographic changes have been quite compelling. And as of a couple of years ago, I, I, I was saying, we don't really know what, what this all is about. 2.6% of boomers do, 4.2% of Gen X, 10.5% of millennials, and 20.8% of Gen Z. Which means if we follow this trajectory, we will all be gay in 2054. <laughs> 
However, this also coincided with the pandemic and a period of social isolation for a lot of kids. Kids started to consume social media in so many hours every week beyond anything anybody ever saw before. And so deprived of ordinary social contact at school and in the neighborhood, kids were going online to, to uh, relate to others. And I think there were some untoward effects of that, which we're still seeing. She came out as trans in the middle of COVID. So this was lockdown period, right before ninth grade. This is when it really reared its head. And that high school, public high school, charter school, uh, changed her name on the email and what they were calling her at school. No, they did not call me. No, they did not inform me. Now, of course, I knew because it's the pandemic and she's in the room down the hall. And so when I looked on her computer, it had a male name and it had male pronouns and everybody was referring to her as him. So I called the school, again, not knowing what I was walking myself into and um, gave them a little piece of my mind. And the school said, well, we want her to be safe. Him, sorry, we want him to be safe. This is a safe space. And I thought, well, that's absolutely absurd because she's down the hall from me. How is the school safe? Being a safe space because you're calling her a different name? This is insane. A lot of schools are making new policies and guidelines for gender expansive students, what they call it sometimes. So, so for example, just simply like name and pronoun changes, you know, they have policies that say don't tell the parents unless the child allows. And they have rules about how they're allowed to change it, you know, just in their system. But then when they contact the parent, they say the other name and all kinds of ways of how to basically circumvent the parent. The goal of the transition closet is for our students to be able to wear the clothes that their parents approve of, come to school, and then swap out into the clothes that fit who they truly are. They're severing the parent-child relationship. They're telling kids, you can transition without, without your parents. We won't tell them. Um, it will be just between us. That basically isolates a child, and then any adult could prey on them. They have no trusted adults around them. They have no one looking out for them. You are fighting against the world getting to your child. There are no safeguards in place. They should be automatic, and they are not. They require the parent to almost have a full-time job of checking what their child is looking at. iPads are given out at schools, so you have to check those iPads. They can get to YouTube. YouTube, you can set a, you know, YouTube to age 12, 11, 10. It doesn't matter. This stuff gets through. You can put the most uh, what you think are the strongest parental blocks on their phone, they still get through. The tech companies know this. They want this stuff to get through. There's been uh, a lot of instances online, uh, social media, uh, of coaching. Some even more critical than I would say grooming. And, uh, and you can go online any day of the week and find them. If you go on YouTube, you can just in, put in, in the inquiry, 100 most influential trans influencers. It pops up, they've been counting them. I think TikTok is geared towards children and youth. And there are a lot of activists on there who are not necessarily teachers, but they're just, you know, what they call TikTok famous. And they also target children. So for example, Jeffrey Marsh, he specifically targets kids. I mean, he clearly says in his videos, I want to talk to the kids or hey kids. Hi kids. Hi kids. Hey kids. Hi kids. Hey kids. Hi kids. Hi kids. Hey kids. I want to talk to the kids. I want to talk to the children. He has a Patreon where kids can come talk to him privately. I mean, we're talking about serious groomer stuff and this stuff is all over TikTok. And then you have kids going on TikTok for entertainment and the algorithm is feeding them this content and they get sucked in. I really do love you. I was thinking about you. Don't worry about hurting a parent's feelings. Your parents made mistakes. A toxic parent will be very mean to you, very cruel to you, very hard to you. I will tell you a little something about going no contact. If you do not have a family that loves you, I'm going to be your family. 
it could destroy America because, you know, who's leading our next generation if all of these kids are just wandering around totally lost and confused about themselves? The social media companies have admitted that there's some work to be done in terms of the deleterious effects of their algorithms upon the mental health of young people. And I couldn't agree more. There, there's, there's a lot to be learned about all that. When whistleblower Francis Haugen pulled back the curtain on Facebook last fall, thousands of pages of internal documents showed troubling signs that the social media giant knew its platforms could be negatively impacting youth and were doing little to effectively change it. I'm here today because I believe Facebook's products harm children, stoke division, and weaken our democracy. The company's leadership knows how to make Facebook and Instagram safer, but won't make the necessary changes because they have put their astronomical profits before people. I don't think it's debatable that social media can have a shaping and developmental impact on young people. We've compromised our kids' immune systems. Now, they're, then they're, when they're exposed to digital viruses, they don't have an immunity to it. They don't have an uh, intrinsic core identity or core values. We made them brittle and fragile, and then big tech vultured them, uh, attacked them. So when she made her pronouncement that she was trans, mm -hmm. and at that point, she was severely depressed, not getting out of bed, eating was an issue, getting dressed was an issue. The very basic things of life were an issue. She was suffering immensely. And then I had to, I grabbed the phone. I got into all of her social media and in fact, she actually gave me the passwords because she knew that something was happening to her. And I got into all of it and I spent literally a week, sorry, I'm gonna cry. I spent a week going through everything on her phone and seeing what she was exposed to and reliving that as you can see is still really emotional because what I saw was the sheer indoctrination What I saw was pedophiles pushing pornography to her and not, the pornography was um, designed for kids. It was cartoons, um, it was anime characters, it was incest, it was um, just so perverted. Anime, is a big you know, component of what drove my daughter to this. Um, anime is you know, the Japanese cartoon. And so, and I thought it was cute because she liked to sew. I mean, again, my daughter was a really girly girl. She had been sewing since she was in like third grade. Um, but she would sew, you know, sew these costumes. And a lot of them were the anime characters. And I, I mean, I even took her to anime conventions and I would go, I need to be there, she's a young, girl, I need to see what's going on. I went to these, I mean, the majority of them were, you know, it's a bunch of nerds dressed up as characters. I would actually say it was wholesome. And then it gets dark. You start at G, you move to PG, then you move to R, and then you end up moving to X. And again, it's a progression. They find these kids who really are into anime, and so it may be innocuous to begin with. And then it moves towards fetish. And that's where anime goes. So you have an anime character, the female characters tend to be adorable or extremely sexy. Tiny little ways, big breasts, beautiful cartoon women, and they're airheads and they're ditzes and they're dumb. Nobody wants to be one of those. And then they have the anime boys and you'll have a very masculine anime boy um, who will be like, the typical man, and then you'll have the gay partner who is sweet, um, emotional, like what one would typically look at as a female. And so these girls don't want to be the ditzy, big-breasted girl. They want to be the gay man. 
And so they conflict, they, they mix this all up and they think, oh, I must be, I must be gay. There are a lot of depictions of uh, transgender uh, transitions that make it seem simple. You know, you just declare yourself this way, everyone's gonna fall in line, they're gonna use your preferred name and pronouns, and then you're gonna go on medicines, and you know, your body's gonna change, and, and you're gonna be completely different, and it's gonna be more in tune with what you want. I hear the stories where people are rudely awakened by the fact that their fantasies don't turn out to be real. So I hear young people saying to me things like, well, I don't really wanna be a man, I want to be a gay boy, but I want to take testosterone to look more male. And usually I have to explain to them that testosterone doesn't have such uh, specific effects that you can control like that. And that taking uh, testosterone, which is a controlled substance and is among the most powerful biochemicals that we know, is not to be done lightly. And that what happens is irreversible physical changes that you can't undo just by stopping the, me the medicine. There does seem to be some blurring of the uh, boundaries between fantasy and reality. So I'm actually a trans man. Um, I've been cosplaying for six years now, and um, I've noticed that a lot of my friends who cosplay are queer, and which makes it such like a nice and open community. I identify as bi, and I feel like a lot of my friends that are into anime, they also identify as queer on, on some part of the spectrum. I honestly don't know very many straight people yeah. that are <laughs> into anime. So I'm a trans mask, um, I use he, him pronouns, I'm poly, and I'm queer. But is there any anime content itself that uh, helped you figure out who you really were? Or was that like more so the community? I would say it was more the community. I was around a lot of queer people just from being into anime and it helped me a lot when I was figuring things out because even though I didn't have that support at home, I had a really tight friend group that was really supportive. And once they're really into anime, then they get on the Discord and they talk about the anime and then somebody older starts sending them hentai. Hentai is the porn version of anime. So you'll have uncles raping nephews in it, all cartoons. You'll have incest, bestiality, all in cartoon to of course appeal to young kids. Once one of the kids in the discussion found the X-rated stuff, they would send it all to each other. So they were all indoctrinating each other. You know, mostly the older kids doing it to the younger kids, grooming each other. If you look at appropriate uh, child development, there are stages that kids need to go through before they get to that uh, sexual awareness, gender awareness, you know, typically closer towards puberty. Uh, before puberty, um, there's, there's social norms that are being taught. There is, there's, there's, there's fundamentals of being a human that are being taught that, that, that if you're, when you drop the gender content too early or expose a young child too early, it, it's, it's, it's grossly negligent and it's borderline child abuse because it's developmentally inappropriate. I think there has to be a developmentally appropriate uh, approach to these subjects, just like there is in many other subjects. I don't think we've found that uh, optimum balance yet of affirming and supporting, but educating. The first psychologist we got, she told me that I needed to call my daughter by a male name. She told me that um, my daughter had a 41% chance of committing suicide. She hadn't read the study I did, the 41% study. But she's, you know, that's not what the study says. But that's what she told me. You know, the, would you rather have a dead daughter or live son? She told me that my memory of my child being very girly was a cover for when she was going to announce her transgenderism. Yeah. It's like she wanted my daughter to have the trans identity. I called doctor after doctor after doctor, trying to find someone who was interested in unraveling. The causality was really difficult. I had doctors who were interested, but they were afraid because of the anti-conversion laws in California. So they didn't want to touch it. When I talk about being too far gone, not, I don't really know what else to call it. Um, this is what I mean. This is how deep my voice is. Um, <clears throat>
it's gotten deeper over time and it's settled. Um, this is what I mean by hair loss. Um, and it just keeps getting worse. It keeps thinning. It keeps receding backwards. I really don't see those being fixable. So that's when I talk about, you know, just kind of staying how I am, regardless of how I feel. Um, that's why, just because I, I don't really see me personally being able to come back from what's happened so far. This is what happens when you give a woman testosterone this is for five years. This is what happens, essentially. I was told that I was being given a cure, and I... I wouldn't want to kill myself anymore. Um, and it wasn't true. There are so many mental health disorders that make you hate your body. And the solution isn't to change your body, it's to fix your brain, you know? Um, I just don't want anyone else to ever feel this way. I lost my voice, I lost my chest. I don't know if I'm going to be able to have kids. Really hope. That all these professionals get their friggin' karma because I know that some of them don't realize and some of them might be brainwashed and whatever, but some of them know exactly what they're doing. The shaping parts of our society are, are all in. So educational systems, both K through 12 and university systems, which are shaping the therapists and the clinicians who are coming out of that world are now with, have that very specific lens. Our, our popular media has that lens. This is a boom for the medical community, money-wise. They're coming after the kids, and they even say it. The ACLU, they wrote Schools in Transition. And in that manual, it says, talk to the children when they're young. They're most receptive. Of course they are. Kids believe in Santa Claus and the Easter Bunny. It's really easy to trick a kid into things. It just, it, it doesn't feel natural at all. Um, and it very much feels like a social contagion. Specifically with kids, as social media, I think, is not helping it at all. A disturbing new trend surfacing online, and it has to do with the popular video app TikTok. TikTok videos encourage people to self-diagnose disorders that are not common. One Valley therapist says he's seen a sharp increase of kids believing they had everything from OCD to ADHD, even depression and Tourette's. So you want to self-diagnose, but you're scared of getting it wrong and you're scared of kind of where to start with this process. I am pro-educated self-diagnosis and this is a safe space for you guys. Hi, I'm Jello of the Squid System and my head hurts. And usually that means I'm like disassociating and I'm getting really confused and my vision is kind of blurry. So I decided why I'm making TikToks. Might as well make, you know, a TikTok. There's a puzzle on the floor. Anyways, I'm making a TikTok. There's a noise outside. Um, I. Hi. My name's Mara. I can feel it coming on. You didn't historically have hundreds or dozens, um, and it was a very rare disorder. It wasn't, again, like gender dysphoria, it wasn't so common. And they're performative. They go on social media, and the, the popcorn moment is when they switch alters. So you have a host system. You have a 25-year-old female who says, okay, uh, now I'm gonna become 30-year-old LGBTQI, fill in the blank. You know, they, they, they occupy all genders now. It's, this is, talk about, talk about, uh, a bottomless pit. Now they don't even have to choose one gender. They can have alters that are all genders. And so you have DID, young people who are assuming the whole gender uh, spectrum, and it's all performative. It's not the real disorder. It's, it's the attention-seeking, uh, social media-grabbing thing. It's a creation of the times. To stop this, the only way I could stop social media was I took the phone and I bought a little safe and I locked it up, and it was gone. I did what I was told not to do, I did it anyway. The phone was gone, the internet was gone, the friends were gone. We were starting from ground zero again because I needed to win this fight. I've read stories of parents who, whose children started 
questioning their gender and they thought, you know, oh shoot, you know, my, my child is going to be going down this path and it's obviously really harmful. How do I stop it? And most of the stories will say the first step is to completely take away social media from them. You need to take away their phones, take away their social media, and half the problem goes away. I do tell parents to restrict social media and I do tell parents to monitor their, their child's use. When did you notice that your daughter was starting to turn the corner? In, in 2021. We were going on a family vacation which was going to require wearing a bathing suit almost every single day. I actually laid out a bunch of bathing suit options for her and I left them all out on the bed from the bikini that she used to steal from me when she was younger to kind of board shorts and whew, she picked the bikini. Not that clothes make you a woman or not, but she was returning back to her genuine self. It's gonna be challenging to unravel this because it's happened at such a key developmental stages. And what well, we're seeing people who are now detransitioning, but as a society to begin to say, has the pendulum swung way too far when these clinics are giving medical interventions without psychological or psychiatric evaluations, without parental cons uh, consent? I'm so angry that there aren't more people standing up. They know, teachers know, that this isn't real and teachers of 30 years, suddenly you have 10% of your classroom is, is trans identified and you think that this is organic? No, you don't. Be truthful, stand up. There's a lot of Democrats who are against this and there's not one Democratic politician willing to talk about that. And that to me, is a sin that I will never forgive. My party abandoned children and abandoned parents and family and science for that matter. This isn't a political issue. It's not. And the only reason why the Republicans are the voice of this is because the Democrats are too afraid to speak the truth. One of the weapons that the left uses to silence their critics or opponents is name calling, bullying, harassment, and censorship. Go out, buy a gun, learn how to use it. The time to act is now. If you want to call me sir again, I will show you a sir. It is ma'am. I was punched, um, I was hit multiple times, I was shoved. They do that to scare you. So they're not just trying to scare me into silence, they're trying to scare anyone else who might dare think that they should also speak up and expose them. So I think their goal with censoring us is to scare anyone else from, from trying to, to expose them as well. Um, and that's why we have to stand really strong. It's just unfortunate. It's just unfortunate the way that people can't speak. Our legs have been cut off in the sense that I think the adults in the room are, have now been are fearful to speak the truth. My daughter did thank me two weeks ago, um, which was pretty amazing. I still don't think she knows the bullet she dodged, and she probably won't until she matures. I don't think she understands that she was just a dollar sign for the medical community or that pedophiles are preying on these kids. I don't think she gets it yet. Um, she doesn't want to hear another word about it. And why would she? That was a really dark period in her life. I actually really hope that someday she'll be sitting next to me actually telling her story. That's what, that's what I hope. <laughs>